y'all mean what you just sang? Are you sure? Because I'm on, we're going to talk about that today. What did you just sing? What was the song? Jesus at the center of it all? Okay. Okay. Everything. The church. Your life. No, your life. Not the life of the person next to you, because I know you think you're fine. I know you worry about the other person. So Jesus is the absolute center. The focal point, the orientation of your entire being. Okay, I'm just making sure we were singing the same song. Because that's what we're talking about today. And um, therefore is the title of our mini-series that we've been in. And the whole concept is, it's not, it doesn't start with us. God's plan, what God is doing, it doesn't start with us. We respond to God, right? If God is love and God is loving, therefore we are loving. If God is a servant, then therefore we should serve. That, that, that should be the way it works. Uh, we should always be starting with God and work our way down to ourselves. And the human's problem is we start with us and our needs and our wants and then we figure out what God is trying to do. And that's been a problem since the first few pages of the Bible. And so this morning we're going to talk about, as we've discussed, about what it means to be an ambassador for Christ. And, um, and so I'm going to say a prayer and we're going to dive in. Father, we truly are grateful to be able to just take the breath that we just took. To be here, to sing songs about you and to kind of lift our thinking and our minds above the things that we see and experience in this life. To be reminded that there, there is another realm that we can't see with our human eyes and that's even more real than what we really see. And to be reminded that this life is so precious and important and amazing, but this life is only a mist compared to the life we are going to live. This life is really a preparation for the next one and the power of this life is amazing but the power of the resurrection makes makes it true to us believing Christians that when we breathe that last breath that is not the end that's just the new beginning and that is our faith but we don't we just don't get that reinforced when we're uh, looking at Instagram or when we're looking at what's happening in our country none of that gets reinforced it's all about what's now and what's happening and who's got power and all that. So thank you for allowing us to be in this space and to be reminded that everybody in this room is one of your children and that we are family. We've been adopted into your family. Doesn't matter what class, ethnicity, what degrees we have or don't have, what car we have or don't have. And we're grateful for that that this space can be so, so powerful. So I do pray that this morning that we can uh, center ourselves and humble ourselves and slow our thinking down and stop thinking about stuff that's supposed to happen later on the day or this week or please help us to focus in with our hearts right now and and who we are, and be humble to your word. And uh, I just pray that we can be inspired to be privileged and proud ambassadors in this crazy world, ambassadors for your son Jesus. And we pray this in his name. Amen. Amen. So I was supposed to focus on one of the therefores in 2 Corinthians 5. So you know what I do? I usually decide, well, if I'm reading 2 Corinthians 5 on Sunday, I should probably reread 2 Corinthians. So I started in chapter 1. There's a lot of therefores in chapter like 2 and 3 and 4. And I was like, well, I wonder if I should talk about some of the therefores in those chapters. But then I thought, it's nothing worse than a preacher that gets up there and supposed to preach about something and doesn't do it. And I'm not going to be that guy. I'm going to focus on the therefore that I'm supposed to be preaching about. 
But then there were two therefores before the therefore I was supposed to preach about in chapter 5. And I'm like, therefore I must preach about at least one of them. Surely it was the Spirit that told me that. So before we get to the therefore we are Christ's ambassadors, there's another therefore that I think is therefore reason that we need to talk about. Did you catch that? Oh! I've been practicing that all week in front of the mirror. All right, there you go. I think we need to focus on this other therefore real quick before we dive into the ambassador therefore. See if this works. All right. Love Jesus. Jesus at the center. Oh, you know what? The doohickey is not in the thing. The doohickey that goes in here. You're going to need that doohickey. The doohickey is no longer here. All right. They're probably going to advance it from up there. They may not have it, but you know what? I don't need it today. I don't need it. 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 I, I got my glasses. I'm good. I'm good. I'm good. <laughs> Open up your Bible. Turn your Bible on to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. All right. And it's not their fault. Actually, I, did, I didn't email it. I was at a retreat and I drove in like an hour away this morning. I didn't email the backup to them. So it's my fault. Don't get mad at them. All right. 2 Corinthians 5. Verse 14. It says... For Christ's love compels us because we are convinced that one died for all and therefore all died. And he died for all that those who live should no longer live for themselves but for him who died for them and was raised again. And I love another translation that says for the love of Christ urges us on compel, urges us on. And the cool thing about that word that's translated into English, urges on or compel, that's kind of like the not literal translation of that word. Okay. The literal, literal, literal translation of what this word gets at takes us to a scene that many of us appreciate in the Bible that really happened. You remember the woman that had been bleeding? Yes. Remember her? Yes. Completely ostracized completely excluded from society. But you remember the faith she had? If I could just touch Jesus, just get to the cloak, if I could. And you know the story, right? I mean, if you're familiar with the Bible, and she, she just gets through the, this crazy crowd, and she, she touches, and she, what, Jesus stops. She's like, whoa. Like, it was a powerful exchange. Something happened. And Jesus is like, whoa, like, some, some power has gone out from me. And like, who touched me? And he says that to the, his, his disciples. And you know what they say? Jesus, what are you talking about, bro? Do you see the crowd? There are people pressing up against us. How are we supposed to know who touched him? That pressing up, that's the literal word. Same word here is compel. There's something about Christ's love that when you understand it, and when you really lean into it, and you really reflect on it, and you are contemplative about it, right? It's something about that love that just, it just, it, it, it's like a being in a crowd. You can't even help yourself. It's pressing you. It's moving you. It's urging you to, to live a certain way. And that's, that's what he's, that's what Paul is getting at. That, that love of Jesus. You know, Christ's love should lead to us living different lives. It should lead to devotion from us. You know, Christ's love is self-sacrificing too. That's the part about Christ's love is he's, Jesus has given up his life, right? And so how ridiculous would it be for us to say we, Jesus is at the center of my life, but I'm not self-sacrificing, I'm self-seeking. That's the, ch that's the challenge that we face, I believe, in our current moment right now. I think there are, there are many of us that are so egocentric instead of Christocentric, if you know what I'm saying. And I, hey, trust, hey, I'm an only child. I grew up only child. I'm an introvert. Dude, I know what it means to think about yourself more than anybody else. Seriously. That is my default mode, right? Like, I just naturally think about, okay, what about me? What about me? 
Uh, so it's, it's, it's a stretch for me to, to really live like Jesus would want a person to live. But it says Jesus is the one who died for all. There's only one who died for this world. One. The unique life of Jesus of Nazareth. That one death. He died for humanity. For mankind. Whatever. Humankind. He died for every person. L gave up his life. That one life. So that we might reflect on that and choose to make him the center of it all. And to respond. And to live not for ourselves. But here's the problem. I just sincerely believe that a lot of us show up on Sunday with the mindset, I am here to get my needs met. I am here to get my needs met. In other words, I'm in the passive state. I, I'm here to receive the meeting of needs that this church needs to provide me and my family. And I tell you, I'm telling you guys, that is not the body of Christ. That is not operating as the, it, it, that's not the body of Jesus. Jesus didn't come to be served. <laughs> he came to serve. He wouldn't park his car. Actually, if Jesus would come to this church, he'd park in the extra parking lot. <laughs> As a, as a grown man who, who's got good legs, he would park over there to allow other people, he would sacrifice so other people could walk here quicker. And when he walked in the door, his mindset would not be, I am at the center of it all. My needs are at the center of it all. But that is a problem that we have. And I had a conversation with somebody I appreciate. I still respect. I still love. But I'm going to be real. We had a conversation. <laughs> I mean, it was good. It was like, hey, man, you know, me and my family, you know, think we want to go someplace smaller and more intimate. You know, I just wanted to be real and let you know. And he said, man, I want to know how you feel about it. I said, I'll tell you exactly how I feel about it. <laughs> I don't like it one bit. You know what I would like? I would like a real intimate church, too. I moved here in 2007. Pretty intimate church. We were meeting at the Marriott on Windy Hill. We were meeting at the Marietta Conference Center. Pretty, pretty intimate, couple hundred people. I knew, after a while, I did kind of know everybody. Because this particular person made the comment, man, I want to be able to like know everybody in the room after like a year. It's hard to do that in North River. It's so big. I said, yeah, man, I hear you. Because when I moved here, that's what it was. But here's the problem. When people that are intimate and they love Jesus and they invite their friends and their neighbors, everybody starts showing up. And people start showing up and they didn't leave. And so let me get this straight. So we are getting penalized for attracting people or whatever the word is. People were attracted to whatever was happening here. And now that we're a big church, now it's no longer acceptable. And now you got you to gotta bounce because your needs aren't getting met. Hey, man, bro, how do, why don't you stay here and help us figure out how to help the however many members we have now? Now that we're at this point, you know... We're not going to be a 200-person church unless, unless every one of y'all wants to come in here to get your needs met because after a while you're going to leave because they're not all going to get met if that's, your, if that's your criteria. It's not going to happen. You've got to die to yourself and live for him, the one who, who died for you. That's the mindset. The mindset is not, I'm just coming here to get my needs met. <laughs> you know what? In my family, I would love, in my family, I would love to have dinner every night with both my kids. I would love it to hear how their day went. And I would love to help them with their little brushing their teeth and stuff. And, get, and I would love to tuck them in the bed. I would love to read a story and say a prayer. But they are 20 and 19. <laughs> And it's not unnatural and wrong. 
<laughs> my youngest is in Oklahoma going to a nursing program right now. I don't even get to see. But, so I can't get that back. We're not going to get a 200 person church back. We're not going to get the ooh, intimate small thing back right now. So are you going to stick around here and live for Jesus and figure if Jesus was a member here, wouldn't he figure out how can we love all these people that are here in front of us? Let's figure that out together. And I want to commend you that for those of you that are still here, that are still here, even though we have messed up and taken two steps forward and three steps back, even though we don't have a smooth transition and figured everything out, for those of you that are still here, I'm just like, thank you. Like, thank you. Let's just keep trying. Man, let's just show up here with this mindset that we are compelled to love because of Christ. He gave us, he showed us the way. And yes, he died because you know what? Suffering is involved in this whole gig. It is. But what's the last part? He was raised. No matter what we go through at this church, it might get bad. It ain't gonna get that bad. You ain't gonna die up on a cross, right? And even if something bad happened, we serve a God who raises the dead. We do get our needs met when we're like Jesus. Jesus wasn't walking around trying to get his needs met. And that's why he was the most joyful person. Even though he was a man familiar with sorrow and suffering, he was the most joyful person because he understood what it means. I'm going to live for the will of the Father, not just my own will. And sometimes I'm going to suffer. But you know what? It's worth it if I'm there doing it for other people. And that's how you get your needs met when you lay your life down and be like Jesus and care about the person next to you more than yourself. Who in the world wants to be with somebody that all they think about is themselves? That's the worst kind of person to be around. Let's not be that in the church. And if you think Paul is just all, this is the only time he says it, think about Galatians 2.20. I have been crucified with Christ and I no longer live. Paul never hung, he didn't hang on a cross when he had written that. But what's he getting at? He, he, he's experienced that kind of death to himself. I've been crucified with Christ and I no longer live, right? But Christ lives in me. Oh, okay. See, when you die to yourself, you give room for Christ to live in you. And he said, hey, but this ain't, this ain't fantasy land. The life that I live in the body, you know, when I wake up every morning and, and do my thing, making tents, I'm still a person. I still live life. The life I live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Galatians 2.20, same concept all over the Bible. That is the heart we need to have. Christ's love compels us, and therefore, we die to ourselves, and we're not worried about our needs all the time. Amen? Amen? We're going on to the next therefore, the one I'm supposed to preach about. All right. <laughs> Technically, it's not the next therefore, but I don't have enough time, but there's a therefore in verse 17. Amen? Therefore, we are a new creation. That's awesome. We love that. But we're going to go down to verse 20. No, we're not. 18, I'm sorry. All this is from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ. Verse 18, all this is from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ. What does reconciled mean? Right, you go, reconciled, what does that really mean? What this word is getting at is there's some type of an exchange that has gone on, right? That's the core of this word, that we are alienated from God. <laughs> Why? Because of stuff we did. Ain't nothing God, God hasn't done anything wrong. We're the ones that mess up and continue to mess up his creation and his, his wonderful world. We're the ones that bring madness and sin and craziness into it. So we have alienated ourselves and we, there's, a, there's a gap. There's, there needs to be some reconciliation. And so what the reconciliation is, is that God is willing to lay aside his wrath, which is completely understandable. We done jacked up his world. He, is, he, he cares about us. He cares about creation. And so we're here messing it up. He, he is justifiably, he has wrath that needs to be executed, but he's willing to lay that aside and he's willing to extend relationship. From wrath to relationship. That's what reconciliation gets at. It's, it's like an exchange. Like he should give us wrath, but he doesn't. 
Instead, he wants to reconcile us to himself. Wow. Well, how is that going to happen when we're all jacked up? There was one life that wasn't jacked up. And that one life we just read about, that he just wrote about, that one life sacrificed his wrath, so to speak, right? Or, or excuse me, it met the needs of that wrath. And so we actually now can be reconciled to God. And then he gave us, who's us? The church. That's who Paul's writing to. The ministry of reconciliation. Oh, wow. So we get to join in on this reconciliation. Verse 19, God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting men's sins against them, even though he could. And he has committed to us the message of reconciliation. We are, we are, therefore, Christ's ambassadors. As though God were making his appeal through us. Wow, God making his appeal through us. So we are Christ's ambassadors. When you hear the word ambassador, that's a kingdom kind of word, isn't it? That's a political kind of word. Now, Paul sometimes used farming metaphors. He'll sometimes use building architecture metaphor. This ain't no building architecture, no farm. This is about, this is like kingdom language right here, right? We just spent like seven months on the Sermon on the Mount. Right? The kingdom. King Jesus. <laughs> and so that thinking that you remember from the Sermon on the Mount hopefully will carry over into this concept of what it means to be an ambassador. We are therefore, because of all that God has done for us to reconcile us, could just, just unleash his wrath on us, lays it aside, extends relationship to us, and then gives us the ministry of that, the service for other people. That's what ministry really means. It means serving other people, Be doing something to benefit another person. That's what that word really means. So we have that. We now, because we've been, see, if you've been reconciled, you become a reconciler. Yeah. Yeah. That's the way the Bible works. Yeah. That's the way, that's what he's saying. Yeah. If you truly have felt that reconciliation, you now become a reconciler. So now you're an ambassador, and you go out into the world and you represent Jesus to this crazy, crazy world. And here's the thing. Reconciliation is, is at God's initiative. He's the one that initiates it. Jesus is the only means through which we are reconciled. And God continues to act through those who have been reconciled. And that is you and me. An ambassador. What do you think about when you're an ambassador? But here's the deal. Ambassadors don't speak to please their audience. They speak to please their king. The one that sent them. You got to remember that in this crazy world we live in. Remember who you're representing. Ambassadors do not speak on their own authority or just air their own opinions, right? They say what they have been commissioned to say. Ambassadors are more than just messengers. They're actually representatives of their king or representatives of their homeland. It is actually an honor, right? It shows that you have a certain kind of reputation for the king to actually consider you worthy to go out and represent him. <laughs> and why were ambassadors sent in the first place? You know why they were sent? They were sent on envoy, as an envoy of goodwill to renew or establish a relationship, right? Those are the, these are positive reasons. To make an alliance, these are the reasons to send an ambassador. All right? So God is sending his ambassadors into this world. Why? Because there's hostility in this world, and we are the ones that try to deal with that in a way to help people get in a relationship, making their allegiance to God. That's why we're here. You know, here's the deal. It's not a cush job. You might think of being an ambassador is a cush job. I'll hang out in the embassy. I get nice meals. That might be what happens in this world. But Paul, he, kept, he said, I'm an ambassador in chains. He's saying all these kind of things. It was a tough gig to be an ambassador in that day. You weren't often given a cush situation. And, and one of the places I read, it said Rome in this day and age, Rome never sent out ambassadors because they were running things. They would send out governors. They would send out army. They would send out people to run stuff. But other nations would send their ambassadors to Rome. Rome was the big dog, right? And so they would say, hey, go to Rome and try to get to the emperor and try to get some good stuff, right? That was the way it worked. But Paul's like, no, nah, it's flipped. God's, God is actually, yeah, he's all powerful, but he's sending out his ambassadors to get in a relationship with you. That's, that's the difference. 
And that's how amazing God is. I read this quote <clears throat> when I was studying this stuff, and I thought it was very interesting. Because here's the deal. We often think, yeah, ambassadors. So we're, go, we're supposed to go out and help people that don't know God, share our faith, right? Help them understand who Jesus is. And then they kind of pledge their allegiance to Jesus. They repent of their sins when they realize who God is. They get baptized. They come out of the water. New creation, newness of life. Amen. And then they, they, they go out and they share their faith. And is that, is that true? Yeah, that's all true. It's all true. That's what we hopefully will be doing. Hopefully we feel compelled by Jesus' love to go out and share about how amazing he is. Hopefully we love being an ambassador for Jesus to people that don't know who he is or have a twisted view of who he is. Is that true? Absolutely. As a lost world needs to be reconciled to a loving God? Absolutely. But that's not the only, we're missing something very important in this passage. Paul says, we implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. Who's Paul writing to? He's writing to the church. We implore you on Christ's behalf, church, be reconciled to God. And you say as the church, oh, Jeff, I got baptized back in uh, 87, bro. I already got reconciled. I'm good. And maybe you misunderstand. This is being written to the church. <laughs> there is a reconciliation that happens when we have this kind of salvation moment, right? Go through the process, what salvation is, right? We receive that initial salvation from God who rescues us from our sinful lives. That is true and that is good and amen. But if you think that's the only reconciling you need for the rest of your life, you are wrong. You are wrong. There is a continuing type of reconciliation that needs to kind of continually happen because sometimes even the church gets sideways. What are you talking about, Jeff? What am I talking about? Why in the world are we reading 2 Corinthians? Guess what? There was a 1 Corinthians. There's actually a letter before that. And what's the problem? Because the Corinthians are out there. You got people taking, you got brothers and sisters taking each other to court. What? You got people humiliating the wealthy people or humiliating the poor people, you know, even at the Lord's Supper. What? You got people sleeping with their fathers. What? What? In the church, this is what Paul's writing about. You guys are crazy. You, need to be re you guys need to be reconciled to God. You've gotten off track. You act, you act like you don't have, you know, God's not going to do, do some stuff to you. You better watch out. Be reconciled to God now. That's a continual thing. <clears throat> and I read this quote, <coughs> excuse me. And uh, this guy, David Garland, he said, the fundamental problem behind the Corinthians misunderstanding of Paul and the resulting friction that they have, there's a lot of friction between Paul and the Corinthian church, is that the Corinthians are not fully reconciled to God. It explains why the values of the pagan society with its hyper-factionalism. You ever heard that word before? I don't see that often on... Yeah. Hyper factionalism. Hyper means it's like intensified. And you know what a faction is? Basically like divisions. Does that sound familiar? Hyper factionalism. Huh, you ever seen that in our culture today? Oh my gosh. Enmity. What? It's like, it's like anger between people. You know, like just that, uh. So we got factions, we got anger. And power plays to gain supremacy and influence. Woo! Wow, wait a minute. But this is because this is happening in the church. Hyperfactionalism in the church. Here's the deal. <clears throat> right now in California, they are getting ready because they know the storm is coming. They, they got radar. The governor has already deployed, I think, a lot of people there, thousands of people that are ready for water rescues. Why? Because he knows the storm is coming. 2024 is coming. There's an election in this country that's coming. That's right. It's straight crazy. <laughs> we went through it 
eight years ago? Is it four years ago? I mean, we've been through this before. I see the storm coming. I see y'all with hyperfactionalism. One on this side and one on the other side. I see enmity coming between you guys. Brother to brother, sister to sister, because of a political situation in this country. I see, I see the storm of brewing. I see the power play to gain supremacy and influence over others to get people to influence their lives. Here's the deal that, here's what bothers me so much, if I can be real honest. <clears throat> I just believe that people got to stop. Either you believe that God can change the world through <clears throat> Jesus and what he did on the cross, or, or you just don't. <clears throat> so, because here's the deal. Why is it that there are some that are going to try to tell me, Jeff, you have got to vote for political party X because if so, <clears throat> then we can get the political power to get our values passed as laws in this country to force people to be like Jesus. <laughs> or, or, or we're not going to have the type of country that we want uh, if we don't get this type of politics in office in power. So let me get this straight. So, so you seriously are saying to me that Christianity is less powerful in this country unless we ally with a earthly political power? No, no, but I'm being honest with you. That's the way it sounds to me. Like the country's gonna go to pot. You know, Christianity won't even have a chance anymore if, unless we get the power. We gotta grab for the power. And if you don't, you're not really a Christian. You're not, you, you, you're not really understanding how urgent the, the situation is. I go, am I reading the same Bible? <laughs> that is not how God works. He doesn't need help. <laughs> but that's how we are. That's how we are. If this guy gets in, this is going to be terrible. If this guy, oh my God. Dude, when Jesus was there, there was a guy running things politically. Didn't work out good for him. He hung, died on a cross. Oh man, I guess Christianity ain't got a chance. Oh wow, the church still grew. Doggone it, even without anybody on the Supreme Court? Yeah, not even without anybody on the Supreme Court. The church still grew. Wow, how did that happen without any political power? Why was it that when Jesus is, is, is literally beaten to disfigurement, no, pretty well, right? And, 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 and Pilate is like, hey man, you mean you're going to crucify your king? And the, and, and, the, and the Jews at the time, God's chosen people to be light to the nations that, that should never have needed an earthly king. God's people, the representatives of God's people, Say to Pilate, uh, oh, we have, we've got a king. His name is Caesar. Oh, wow. Really? That's what's happening today. I see the storm of brewing. Who are you an ambassador for? Like, which kingdom do you really think has the most influence? Because let me tell you something. Christians are never going to look awesome or influential usually. That was why the Corinthians had a problem with Paul. He didn't look the part. <laughs> he's in prison half the time. He's not wealthy. He's not very eloquent. And Paul keeps saying, that's how you know I'm actually the right guy. <laughs> that's
that's literally his argument. Guys, I'm, I'm, a, I'm just a cracked up, you know, play, clay pot. But man, but what's in me is powerful. Like, it's good to re- remember how messed up we are because the contrast is greater. If you see how, how I, I don't have political power, I don't have economic power, not many of you are wise by human standards, all these things, but it's the power of God that shines through even more. But when we're power grabbing, we don't look any different than anybody else. Anybody can power grab to try to force people to do stuff and call it Christianity. Christianity is no coercion. So stop allying ourselves as if that's the move that God needs or else it can't happen. What you need to remember is Jesus is the center of it all. Jesus is the center of the church. He was when he hung on a cross. He was after he rose from the dead. And even with no political power, people went from some minuscule place and now have been all over the world with a message that still 2,000 years later is ringing true even though they never had. And when they did have political power, you could argue that was when it got the worst. I see the storm of brewing. Don't let it happen here. That's why I appreciate Paul. He's like, man, I showed up. I said, you know what? Y'all can, what you want to talk about? Oh, let's talk about this. Let's talk about that. What do you want to talk about, Paul? Christ crucified. Yes. Yeah, but what about the political situation over here? You know what? Jesus is the son of God. He's, he's love incarnate. God wants to be reconciled to you. Man, are you talking about all this religious stuff? God wants to be reconciled with you. That's the most important thing going on. No, what's most important is taxes. What's most important is abortion. What's most important... Jesus Christ crucified. The church as God's plan to change the world. But the church is irrelevant. The church is not going to, it's always going to look irrelevant. That's the point. Jesus looked irrelevant hanging on a cross. That's the message. But you got to trust. Stop trusting in man's ways. Be an ambassador for Christ. Go out there, yes, share your faith. Share, but share about who Jesus is as the true answer to the madness of this world. I'm going to say a prayer and we're going to take the Lord's Supper. <clears throat> Father, I just, uh, I just pray that we can uh, be grateful. That we can take this moment while we wish we could be seated around a table like Jesus was with his disciples and have a meal and how they did in the first century. We, here we are in a big room like this. We're trying our best to figure out how to do it. I just hope you can accept what's happening right now. We're trying to commune with each other. We're trying to remember how amazing it is that Jesus died for us. That one died for all and therefore we have chosen to die to ourselves. And that we also can be raised again. So when we take this bread that represents Jesus' body and drink this juice that represents his blood, I really pray that we can really be grateful that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. Always has been, always will be. We pray in his name. Amen.